Well, greetings, everybody, to all of you in Christ, or who want to be in Christ, and certainly I hope you will want to be in Christ, brethren. I, I commend you, and I am very happy to start this second part on the glorious good news of God, the wonderful good news of the kingdom of God and what he's bringing to us. And so, brethren, I hope you'll enjoy this. I praise God that he's allowing someone like me to um, uh, be able to bring this to you, and I look forward to it. So, someone like me with no resume to brag about, you certainly have no resume to brag about, to be able to preach about his glorious good news. Do you know what? He wants you and me to wake up and trumpet this glorious gospel, both by our day-to-day life, and that's the most important way, to everyone we can who sees in us something they want. And you know how much we all far, fall far short of that. We all do. We all fall far, far short of that. And um, But at the same time, brethren, guess who we are? We're the bride of the Son of God. Do you think any bride could possibly keep quiet about her upcoming marriage if she loves her fiancé and is excited about what's about to happen? We should be at least as excited as a young bride who's thrilled to be getting married finally and looking forward to it. Don't worry if you feel unqualified to be talking about the good news. Who is qualified? Even the Apostle Paul said that he was chief sinner. It's in our very recognition of our weakness and our unworthiness that Christ is glorified. God calls the weak of the earth. No resumes, no about us column on their website because it's not about us anyway. That's why I don't have one on mine. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's about the message. It's about God. It's about His coming kingdom. It's about Jesus Christ. That's why I don't have an about me section on the website. No flesh can boast and should boast. Our boast is not in our experience is not in our resume, is not in our accomplishments, is not in where we went for training, is not in a clean record. No, our boast is in Christ and what He is accomplishing through more mere corrupted earthen vessels like you and I are. Look at the ones Jesus used to spread the gospel of the kingdom of God. Mere fishermen, men of despised Galilee with no Yale degree, no Harvard degree, no divinity school degree. Matthew, a despised tax collector. Simon the Zealot, part of a fanatical movement. To whom did God first reveal the risen Son of God? He chose Mary Magdalene, you can find in John 20, out of whom were cast seven demons. A woman was the first witness. Women were not official witnesses back then. And a woman who'd had seven demons? What a, what a, what a testimony to the kind of people God uses. Who did Christ use to reveal his presence and who he was in, in the city of Samaria? The woman at the well who'd had five husbands. And she went, she was so excited about it, she left the water that she had come to get there at the well. She couldn't even think about anything else. That's the kind of excitement I think God wants us to have as we near the end of the age and get close to the return of Jesus Christ. And we find God's people are asleep. We find God's people talk about anything and everything else after services. Rarely, except the very few are on spiritual things that says the carnal, physical people have their mind on physical things in Romans 8. And those who are spiritual have their mind on spiritual things. So brethren, let's wake up to this. In our weakness, Christ is made strong. In our weakness, He is able to work and be seen. I just had to say that. God willing, I hope to have a whole sermon about being made strong in our weakness. This is Philip Shields, and nobody by the world's standards, by the church's standards. But now I'm God's son and part of the bride of Christ, God willing, bringing you the glorious good news of God and the glory of his son to establish his kingdom through faith in his grace, peace, and salvation. I will not turn to or even quote every scripture I'll be using. If you want all those, please print the transcript. <clears throat> Today I want to talk about how broad and how all-encompassing the full gospel is then show how the gospel is not just a message to be heard, but God's way of life to be obeyed and lived. <clears throat> we'll also cover how the gospel was revealed to mankind, even in the Garden of Eden onwards. The Old Testament will never seem the same to you again when you're done today. And I hope you've heard part one uh, hearing uh, before hearing this message. 
In part one, we discussed the exciting gospel, how exciting it should be to us. I discussed how there can only be one gospel, but that one gospel is much, much, much broader than most definitions I've seen. The gospel is not, quote-unquote, just about... It is not just about this or just about that. It's not just about the kingdom. Nor is it just about Jesus. Nor is it just about grace or just about salvation or just about the cross. And there are people preaching that. However, the one complete true gospel encompasses all of that and much, much more, as you'll see today. I think I showed a lot even last time. The one true gospel is much more, much more encompassing. It is the gospel of Christ, of the kingdom, and of the gospel of God. There are people who preach otherwise. I've even seen some literature that belittles those who would preach a gospel of grace or a gospel of salvation. But brethren, if you're one of those who believe that the gospel is limited in what it is, please listen carefully. You're not my enemy. You're my friend. You're my brother. But I pray, and I pray hard, Pray to God that you will see that when we belittle a gospel of grace or the gospel of salvation, we are belittling Scripture because Scripture speaks of the gospel of grace in Acts 20, verse 24. Write it down if that's a surprise to you. The Scripture speaks of the gospel of your salvation. In Ephesians 1, 13, Scripture discusses even the gospel of peace. In Ephesians 6, verse 15, again, get the transcript, but there are uh, booklets out there, several, that belittle anyone who would have anything but a certain gospel. But the gospel of God is all-encompassing of so much, as you're going to see. God's good news is huge, very encompassing, but it's all part of the one true gospel. The gospel of God is about his kingdom, but it's also about its king. I read last time, write this down if you have forgotten it, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, where Paul says he's going to describe and define the one true gospel that he preached. And he says so clearly there as he defines it in 1 Corinthians 15. Go ahead and turn there if you like. Uh, Verse 1, I declare to you the gospel I preached. Here's what it's going to be. I'm going to tell you what I preached. And then in verse 3 he says, in defining the gospel that he preached, by the way, I I received an email a few months ago from, I don't know, it wasn't signed. Somebody said there's not a single verse anywhere in the Bible that says the gospel is about Jesus dying on the cross. Well, they haven't read the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 4 says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. And now he's defining, like he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, what his gospel was, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The good news has to include the message of how to get into that glorious kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 cannot be denied. Paul clearly says it must include the message of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, or there is no gospel, or there will be no kingdom, or there will be no future. Do we get it? It must include the message about Christ as well as the kingdom that Jesus will rule until he hands it over to the Father. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15 also. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's about all the gospel that he's preaching. It's about the resurrection. It's about Jesus coming back, being the first to be resurrected, or else we have no hope. Read it for yourself. Some of you attend churches that deny the gospel can be about Christ. Be careful, brethren, lest you be finding yourself denying Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. Now turn to Romans 1, Romans 1, verses 1 to 3. This is uh, by way of quick review, but there uh, Paul says the gospel of God, and the gospel of God, Romans 1, 1 and 2. Now verse 3 is concerning, concerning what? Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So it must be inclusive of Jesus Christ. It's also concerning the kingdom. It's also concerning grace and peace and salvation. Everything from A to Z in the Word of God. The gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation. He says in Romans 1, you're still there in verse 16, by which we stand and by which we're saved. So it, is, it has very much to do with salvation. Yeah, that's what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. It's all in my transcript. In Acts 28, 23, Paul says that as he preached from morning to evening about the kingdom, his message persuaded them also, quote, concerning Jesus. Now the prior said about the kingdom, that it says concerning Jesus, both from the law and the prophets. It's all part of the same gospel. And verse 31 says something similar. So the gospel is very broad. That's Acts 28, verse 23, and verse 31. In fact, I now feel that the one true gospel is the entire word of God from Genesis through Revelation. Maybe I'm saying it too broadly, but you know what? I, as I study every single word that has the word gospel in it, I think it's the whole Bible. It's God's plan to save humanity. It includes God's plan to prepare a bride for the second Adam, Jesus Christ. It's also about God's plan to have his family back in his presence in the Garden of Delights. That's what Eden means. It's God's plan to establish his kingdom on earth. It's God's plan to replace the cherub, blocking the way into God's presence that you'll find at the end of Genesis 3 <clears throat> when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden with something much more wonderful. Jesus, the door, the way to salvation. It's about his kingdom and how we must first be saved to be in that kingdom. And it's also very much about Jesus as I clearly showed last time. It's certainly also about how Jesus, through his blood, cut us loose from the chains of sin that has bound us, and those chains of bondage drop with a resounding clang on the prison floor, the spiritual prison floor, and then we're led into his wonderful, gracious freedom. That's also wonderful, awesome, good news, brethren, that we've got to be trumpeting. I'm frankly amazed at what I just said. I'm frankly amazed that God loves me, that he could love me and wash me of all my sins, every single one of them. That's awesome news for me and for you. There are many times I've gone astray, but part of the good news is that God's love is stronger than my weakness. Did you hear that? You need to hear that. God's love is stronger than your weakness. That's part of the good news too. It's called the gospel of grace, the gospel of salvation. It is the one true gospel that includes the kingdom, salvation, grace, Jesus, all of it. All of that was preached too. In fact, I asked you last time to do a concordance study on the word preach or preached or preaching to see what the apostles actually did talk about and if you did do that, and I hope you will, you'll see that they, yes, they indeed preach the kingdom. And, but there are also numerous places where it says they came either preaching Christ or preaching the kingdom and the name of Christ. For example, I'll read one to you here in Romans 15. But I, I, if you go through the book of Acts, it's just loaded with them in Acts 8 and 9 and many, many places where it talks about them preaching Christ. Anyway, in Romans 15, verses 15 to 21, if you'd read this with me, a passage I didn't use before, uh, it has many of these elements included in it. Romans 15, verses 15 to 21. I recommend that you do your own study on the, on the word gospel. Read every single place where it is and find out for yourself what the gospel is. Don't read some booklet. Don't even hear this sermon uh, as your basis, uh, as your conviction until you do a full study yourself. Let the Bible preach to you. Let the Bible speak to you. And then review a few things. But anyway, Romans 15, verses 15 to 21. Let's read it now. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentile, ministering the gospel of God. So he talks about it. He describes it here, the gospel, the good news of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I don't dare speak of any of these things which Christ has not accomplished uh, through me 
in word or deed to make the Gentiles obedient. I want you to understand there's obedience there too. In mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. So you see, even obedience is part of the gospel in the context here. So that from Jerusalem and round about, I have fully preached the good news, the gospel of Christ. And so I've made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. So he clearly says here that when I go around preaching the gospel, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God, the gospel of the kingdom, that I purposely go to places where Christ hasn't been named yet. And so that's obviously part of the gospel. And I showed you that also in 1 Corinthians 15, the first four verses, and Romans 1, the first three or four verses. So anyway, the God has a kingdom. Let's talk about that. Now, the good news is about God's kingdom. It's a way of life. It's God's family. Uh, Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven. He's the only one who uses the term kingdom of heaven. It's the Father's kingdom. But there's also a verse where it's called the kingdom of Christ and God in Ephesians 5.5. 5. The kingdom of Christ and God. And I want you to understand that because I've heard sermons in the past that have actually said it's not Jesus' kingdom. It's God's kingdom. Well, Jesus is also God, folks. And Jesus made it very clear that his Father had bestowed upon... He says, I, I bestow upon you a kingdom as my Father has bestowed upon me a kingdom. Luke twenty-two twenty-nine. Luke 22, again in the transcript. And he was born to rule over a kingdom that would have no end, is what it says in Luke 1. Verse 33, several times Jesus refers to the kingdom as his kingdom, as his own kingdom. I have, I have that in the transcript, Matthew 13, 41, Matthew 16, 28. Jesus also did teach us to pray, Our Father in heaven, your kingdom come, so that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's Satan's world right now. God has veto power as to what Satan will do. God is certainly, there are many verses in the Old Testament that say God is the one who sets up the basis of men over the kingdoms. God is the one who still rules the earth ultimately. But it's not really ultimately his world right now. And Jesus is coming in Revelation 11. It says at the seventh trump, Now have the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. So when God sends Jesus to take over, after everything's in place, only God's will will be done on earth eventually. It'll take time. It takes three years for Egypt to come to the Feast of Tabernacles, for example. But praise God and Lord hasten that day. When we see what's going on in the world today, and as I speak, what's going on in Lebanon between the Hezbollah and, and Israel, but plus Iraq, Iran, and so on, we should pray all the more fervently, Thy kingdom come. Are we praying that prayer? And not just a list, a, 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 a phrase on a, a prayer list, but from our heart, we're begging God. That kingdom is coming with power and might, and there will be horrible war before it can be set up. But in the end, every knee shall bow to the King of Kings, and we should be bowing our knee every day, many times a day, to the King of Kings. When God sets up His rule on earth, the family of God, the kingdom of God will rule the earth. Then... The murderous nonsense in the Middle East will stop. The butchery between the tribes in Africa will stop. Satan's reign of terror in the inner cities around the world, even here in America, will stop. Famines and the weather out of control will stop. And you've been invited to be part of that real kingdom. The massacre in Darfur, which far, far eclipses what's going on in, the, in Lebanon. There have been hundreds of thousands butchered in the Sudan, most of them Christians by the Islamic forces there. And the Western world stands by. We need to pray, Thy kingdom come. A kingdom of spirit beings, for one must be born of spirit to be in that kingdom. We read that in John 3. One must be born again. You cannot enter. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you be born of spirit, of water and spirit. And one who is born of spirit, Jesus says in John 3, is like the wind. And so when we're born of spirit, we are and we shall be like him, invisible spirit beings. 
And at that time, sin will be impossible for us, for he who has been born of spirit, it says in 1 John 3, 9, cannot sin. 1 John 3, 9, cannot sin. That's wonderful good news too, isn't it? The millennium is ruled by the kingdom of God when Jesus comes and sets up the thousand-year reign. But the millennium technically is not the kingdom itself. It's ruled by the kingdom. We think of God's kingdom, I think, in, in too much in terms of things and physical, point, physical things. And that misses the point. The kingdom of God is not the physical houses or food or the bountiful harvest. In fact, we're told clearly by Paul in Romans 14 that the kingdom of God is not in food and drink. It's not the plowman overtaking the reaper. That's the result of the kingdom of God being administered on earth. But the kingdom of God, we're told in Romans 14, 17, is righteousness and peace and joy. We could add love and spiritual things. I think we need to think far more spiritually, brethren. Those who are in Christ think of spiritual things, not physical things. So the millennium, though ruled by the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is the family of God, born again as spirit beings. The good news is that that kingdom is coming. And the family of God is coming to set up that God's way on earth. And when Jesus returns, if we are in Christ now, we will return with him on spiritual white horses as part of the army of God, commander of the host. This is very much a part of the good news. This earth's governments are on a downhill slide to oblivion. America is already bankrupt. Unless God's Son, God's Bride, and the angels of heaven come down in power and glory and might to take over, there will be no flesh saved alive. We're going to be part of that Operation Rescue because the good news, because of the good news of what the Son of God has already done and did 2,000 years ago, we're going to be able to be part of an Operation Rescue. If it wasn't for what he had done, there would be no rescue. The kingdom of God, please remember, is not flesh and blood. We rule the earth. The physical millennium is ruled by the kingdom. But technically it's not the kingdom itself. I believe it's possible, by the way, that we will rule on the earth, work on the earth, and have our home in heaven. Heavenly Jerusalem. That's not a doctrine that I'm preaching as dogma, but I think it's very possible. Just like a man lives in his house and may go out to work or go to the field to work. Heavenly Jerusalem is our city. That's where our home is. We're considered being born there in heavenly Mount Zion. That's a future sermon. And I just got that material from a study I recently read from another speaker. But go back and read uh, Psalm 87. I've talked about that before. Psalm 87, verses 5 and 6, that it says... It will be said that this one was born in Tyre, this one was born in Philistia, but of this one it will be said, you were born in Mount Zion. That's a prophecy for us. That will be a future sermon. But whether or not that part's entirely correct, I'm still studying it, we know that there will be a spearhead of God's kingdom. We will be part of the spearhead of God's kingdom, the first fruits, setting it up. Jesus is the very first of the first fruits, making the rest of us holy, because it says in Romans 11, in Romans 11:16, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. We're the lump. <laughs> All of creation is about the good news of preparing a kingdom for the bride of Christ. All of creation is groaning, awaiting the, the change, or awaiting our, the coming of the kingdom, awaiting God's way, awaiting the fruition of all the things that Jesus has already done, which is also part of the good news. And they will be co-heirs of all. We will be co-heirs of all things, ruling from Christ's throne. In fact, creation's groaning, it says. And Jesus said, fear not. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We're going to sit with Jesus on his throne. We're going to have a throne of our own. We're going to sit with him on his throne. As a loving wife does, as she snuggles up with her beloved. Revelation 3.21, sit with me on my throne. This is not just some internalized kingdom. It's a real kingdom. We're going to judge world, the world and angels in 1 Corinthians 6. It's, it's for real. It's coming soon. We've got to live it and breathe it. It's awesome news. Turn with me now to Revelation 11. And let's pick up the story of how this gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of Christ come together here. 
This too is the gospel for you and for me if we accept what we're being offered and live the kingdom way, showing we're children of the living God. Let's pick up now in Revelation 11 let's, as we read the end of the book. Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become, have now become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And then they praise him and they give him thanks. Then in verse 19, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. You want to know where the ark is? <laughs> Whether this is the re- the reality, the real ark, or 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 the other one, uh, you know, it says there is an ark there. There were lightnings and noises and thunderings, an earthquake and great hail. The seventh angel, the last trump, is when you and I will be changed to spirit, or if God willed that we should die before Christ returns, we'll be resurrected at the seventh trump into spirit life, and we shall be just like him, transformed as a spirit being. Though lesser in glory, we shall see him, for we shall be like him. First John 3, 2. Brethren, I think it's possible we're going to hear those seven trumpets. Maybe not, but I think it's very possible we will. And we'll, very possible that maybe some will hear it and some won't. Maybe God's people will hear it and the world won't. We'll be counting them off. Wake up. Look up. Your redemption, your redeemer, and our beloved Lord of Lords, our betrothed, draws nigh, it says in Luke 21. Luke 21, 28. And what we're about to read in Revelation 19, if you turn there now, begins to happen from heaven. From heaven. I believe the wedding supper takes place in heaven. I believe God the Father performs it. Who else could perform it? Where else could it be performed? Remember the 144,000 are seen on the sea of glass in heavenly Mount Zion. That's Revelation 14. Let's turn now to Revelation 19. Let's pick up what's happening here. After these things I heard a loud voice. We need to talk so much more about this. Of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, of salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Revelation 19, verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let's be glad and rejoice and give him glory. Revelation 19, verse 7, I'm reading. Let's be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. That's us, brethren. His wife has made herself ready, and to her was granted that she be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, God gives us that righteousness. Paul said, I don't want my own righteousness, Philippians 3, 9. But I want the righteousness which comes by faith. We have to accept that clothing of righteousness which is given to us. And then as we live that way, and we live a more righteous way, it's not our works that does it though. It's the faith and the righteousness and the life of Jesus that does it. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Anyway, I believe all this is going on in heaven. That's what it says in verse 1. Great multitude in heaven. And then uh, then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. He said, Hey, don't worship me, worship God. And then verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened. So again, we're back in heaven and a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. That's symbolic of the fact he's king of kings. He had a name written that no one could know except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His own blood, brethren. And his name is called the Word of God. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And the armies in heaven, and that includes us according to Jude 14 and Zechariah 14, that the saints are included in this. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Don't think those are physical white horses. Those are powerful, awesome, angelic beings. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and that with it he should strike the nations, 
and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. The first thing Jesus has to do is stop the nonsense. He's going to destroy those who destroy the earth. He's not going to play around and mince around with it. He's not coming as a gentle uh, servant on a, on a foal of an ass, on a donkey. Not this time. He's coming as king of kings, conquering. That's good news. Someone's got to have the power to stand up to the beast power, to stand up to the Antichrist, to stand up to the false prophet, to stop the nonsense going on, to stop the persecution and the death that will be happening to many of God's people. And he has on his robe, verse 16, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes, this is part of the gospel. Doesn't that make your heart beat a little faster? I'm jumping around right now as I prepare this, as I, as I speak it. What good news this is. You and I have been called to put a stop to the murderous nonsense and chaos going on all over the world. Please turn with me now to Daniel 7. <clears throat> We will come with love, but at first it's going to be tough love. We, the saints, are going to be given dominion and power to set up God's new regime, regime, God's way. And this is the time of good news spoken of by Daniel the prophet in Daniel 7, verses 24 to 27. The ten horns are ten kings, Daniel 7, 24, who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the first one, shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against God, against the Most High, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. You can't persecute angels, so whenever the Bible speaks of saints, it can include angels, but also definitely includes God's people. Shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change the times and law, the calendar, all of that. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for three and a half years, for a time and times and half a time. The great tribulation, the most horrible part of the three and a half years before Christ comes. Many of God's people are going to have to go through a great tribulation. Others will be spared that. That's another topic, another time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. And then, Daniel 7:27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. You and I are in training, brethren, to rule and to set up God's way and to show servant leadership, to get rid of the mucky mucks who are trying to run things by a dictatorial, self-aggrandizing uh, self way more for themselves. That's not going to be the way we do it, or else we will not be rulers. We have to be practicing that way now in our lives as husbands, as fathers, as mothers, <clears throat> as friends, as neighbors. And his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So we, as the now spirit-born bride and executive assistant of the king of kings, will be given power, authority, and wherewithal to stop the nonsense we see going on. We're going to bring home the hopeless, rebuild the ravaged cities. We're going to be very busy. We're going to need to be spirit beings to get it done. We're going to turn the wilderness into a garden. We're going to reunite families that have been separated by captivity and war, including many millions of Americans and Britons and Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, they're all the modern-day Israel, folks. Don't think that the little nation in the Middle East is all there is of Israel. God said in Genesis 49 that in the, in the last days, Joseph would be great. Joseph is United States and Britain today, and Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. We'll reunite those separated from loved ones. We'll heal the sick, and you and I will let the blind see. And experience the joy of them praising God. And we'll bring hope and a joy to the dying world. And we'll bring them back in an exodus to their lands, to Jerusalem. To come and worship the king. And Isaiah 12 says they'll be coming back with praising and singing. Yes, that's all the good news as well. 
Hallelujah. And praise our loving Abba that he sees fit to let someone like you and someone like me be part of this. I hope you feel the same way. What a great gospel it is. Psalm 149 says we are to praise him even from our beds. We're to praise him even in the dance. That's what Bible says, folks. So the good news is also about Christ and him crucified. As I said in 1 Corinthians 15, the first part of it, that I may have a part in such wondrous times. It's not going to happen unless I accept that as part of the gospel. It's about Jesus rising again to live again in me and for me because he loves me. I'm frankly amazed that God could love even me. After all I've been, after all I've done, and after all I have been, like I said, but you see, now I can be a vehicle for spreading his good news. And you see, God's love, as I said, is greater than my weakness. He alone can wash me completely, and he has. And he wants to wash you too and demonstrate his love to you too. God's love is gospel. God's love is good news. It's part of the gospel of God. God's love, God is love. And so the kingdom of God is about a kingdom of love. Even his law is, is, is summarized. by when they asked Jesus what was the greatest commandment, he said the greatest commandment, he summarized the first four, was to love God with everything you've got. Your whole mind, your soul, your being, everything in you. Love God. And the second is like unto it. Then go out there and love people. Love your neighbor. Love your brother. Love your sister. As you would love yourself. On these hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus said the whole thing is about a way of loving God and loving people. In fact, what I find so amazing is to hear Jesus say in his high priestly prayer in John 17 about how God loves us, that Father above loves you and me as much as he loves Jesus. You know, that's in Scripture. John 17, 23. Let them know that the, you have loved them as you have loved me. That is such good news that a sinner like me can be loved. Can be loved by perfect, holy God. And invited to marry his son, the son of God. I just find that incredible. Makes me lift up my arms, my heavenly Abba. And with tearful gratitude say, Abba, thank you. Thank you. I love you, dear Father. My Abba. My God. And help me love you more. And help me love your people more. And help me love my neighbors more. Help me live your life more. His mercy seat, you see, is higher. Is above the law that was below the mercy seat that condemned me when I broke it, even as you broke it. Mercy triumphs over judgment, James 2.13. Part of the good news is that by grace I have been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. That's what Paul wrote. That's what Paul preached. That was his gospel also. And though he has certainly created me for good works as well, God has created me for good works. It's not by my works that I'm saved. <clears throat> All of that's the good news. But I've also been created for good works. The good news includes the fact that the king of this kingdom, such a wonderful king who sent his only son to pay my death penalty for me, to deliver me from the shackles of the enemy and put me in as a, and, and, and to put me in his kingdom as the deadly clang of chains falling to the prison floor rings around the world in his kingdoms and the Satan's kingdoms when the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and we're the ones ruling it. What awesome news. Can, how much more awesome can that be? One more thing, the kingdom of God, because I'm a co-heir, because you're a co-heir with Christ, I want you to get this. The kingdom of God is now also my kingdom and your kingdom, or will be when we're, when we're given the dominion. 
and your kingdom, brethren. Remember Daniel says in Daniel 7, then the kingdoms will be given to the saints. Wow, wow, and wow. Praise God. We need God's children to take ownership in what is God's family kingdom. It is God's kingdom, but we need to start thinking of it also as our kingdom. Since we're now heirs of God. Galatians 4, 7, an heir of God. Are you feeling it? Are you hearing it? Are you seeing it? As spiritual descendants of Abraham, just as God told Abraham in Genesis 15, 1, I, God, am your exceedingly great reward. Can you understand what he's saying? Your reward is God himself. Brethren, let's get excited and wake up about the gospel. Our reward is God. Psalm 16, 5 says, O Lord, you are my inheritance. O Lord, you are my inheritance. You are my cup. <clears throat> Psalm 73, 26, David got it. He got it. Psalm 73, 26, God is my portion forever. First Corinthians one twenty one to twenty three. First Corinthians one twenty one to twenty three says all things present present or things to come are now yours. All things present and things to come are now yours. And the end of the book in Revelation twenty one verse seven says he who overcomes shall inherit all things. We must be overcomers. <clears throat> That's also part of the gospel. But we're not going to overcome on our own steam. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, we're told in Revelation 12, 11. Revelation 12, verse 11. We overcome the world by faith. Faith in God, faith of God, and faith in God. 1 John 5, 4. Be sure to hear my upcoming sermon on righteousness, yours or God's. We can be of good cheer, Jesus says, because he's already overcome the world. He said that in John 16. Therefore God who is in us is stronger than he who is in the world. So we can now overcome evil with good. It's Jesus in us that allows it to happen. We no longer walk the sinful former way but we now walk as he walked as we overcome the old way. Isn't that incredible? Why don't we shout this from the rooftops? Why aren't we sharing this with everyone we can? The guy you have lunch with, the person you go for a walk with. Why are we so asleep? Why are we so hesitant to speak of it? It says in Acts chapter 8, in the beginning of it, that when the persecution arose, the Christians were scattered and they went everywhere preaching the word. It's around verse 4 or 5 or so of Acts 8. <clears throat> the brethren did. Why are sermons not covering this topic more than ever? The greatest thing in all my life is to love God, to know him better, to live his life, to serve him, to worship him, to be a house of prayer dedicated to him, to be a holy sanctuary for his spirit, to be the tabernacle of David. I've been preaching on these things lately. Please check out many of the topics I have on my website. It has a lot to do with what we're talking about, different angles. All of this is possible because of the gospel of God concerning his son. I just quoted Romans 1, verses 1 to 4. In Romans 1, 16, or in Romans 1, 1 to 4, 1 to 6, it talks about it. Now this... It says there in Romans 1, the gospel of God, and then verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ, declared to be the son of God with power through the spirit of holiness. Then in Romans 1, verse 5, through him we've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. For obedience. The good news is also not just something to be believed, it is something to be obeyed. This is a good segue into that next part we'll talk about, obeying the gospel of God. Notice it says in Romans 1.5, for obedience to the faith. 
The true gospel, as serious and glorious as it is, is also serious business. The Bible does not separate love from obedience, as so many pop psychologists do. You prove your love by your obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, John 14, 15, keep my commandments. John 14, 21 says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. God loves us. God loves us when we accept his love for us and go his way as a way of life, though we often stumble. So the true gospel, as serious as it is, as glorious as it is, is serious business. The Bible does not separate love and obedience. You prove your love by your obedience, John 14, 15, and verse 21. In John 15, verse 9, as the Father loved me, and I also have loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Those who practice a way of life of adultery and lying, homosexuality, and so on, will not be in God's kingdom. But God has given us his power, his Holy Spirit, to empower us. So the gospel must be believed. It says so in Mark 1.15. But it must also be obeyed. It says in 2 Thessalonians, write this down in verses one, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8, that God will be wreaking vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be wreaking vengeance, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel. So there is some teeth to this thing. It's not just about a little baby in a manger. It's about a way of life that we must obey as it's revealed to us. In fact, it says in Revelation 14 that an angel comes out at the very end. Revelation 14, verses 6 to 8. I'll read it to you. Revelation 14, verses 6 to 8. And then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. So to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And so the angel says, in defining this gospel, which is all part of the one true gospel, Fear God! Fear God! Fear God! Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him. <clears throat> who made heaven and earth. Why wouldn't we want to fear God and worship him? Do we worship God? I think I have a sermon on there about worshiping God, being a house of worship, a house of praise. That's what the Tabernacle of David sermons were all about, was worshiping and praise. So notice the gospel is also about fearing God, worshiping him and giving him the glory. And then the good news continues in Revelation 14, verse 8, Babylon is fallen is fallen. Babylon fell once before, it's going to fall again. Modern day Babylon, which I don't believe is New York, I believe is still Europe, and going to be the religious center. A few more verses about how God's loving, how about how loving God is equated with obeying Him. 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6, talks about we cannot claim to know God, we cannot claim that we know Him, but don't keep His commandments, that makes us a liar. 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6. If any of you hearing this have bought into the gospel message that it's only about the grace of Christ, that it's only about the cross, that we have absolutely nothing else to do, I want you to understand that is not a true gospel either. The true gospel says when we accept the love of Jesus, when we accept the cross and glorify the cross, and glorify God in the cross. The next step is obedience. Repentance and obedience. Walking that way. Living a new way. We must walk as he walked. First John 2 verses 3 to 6. We must obey him. 
or else we're liars and don't know Him. The walking the new way is the proof that we have been saved and are being saved. We're done now with a way of life of profanity. We're done with a, a way of life of infidelity and flirting or anything like it. We're done with a way of life of gossip. Though we all fail once in a while in some of these things, I get so tired of this gossip that goes around. I don't have time for it. I don't have time to read the emails. I don't have time to have the phone calls about he said and she said and they said. So tired of it among God's people. Let's get on to start glorifying Jesus Christ and God the Father and living the way of love. Gossip isn't the way of love. Let's stop it, brethren. Gossip is not of God. Let's talk instead of God in His higher way. We're done with a way of life that's wrong. We're starting a new life of love in the kingdom way if we profess the gospel. And so it says in 1 John 3, verses 22 and 23, that because we keep His commandments and do those things pleasing in His sight, that we receive whatever we ask from Him. And now He who keeps His commandments abides in Him, and He in Him. Folks, this is part of the gospel also. <clears throat> this is the good news of the kingdom also. This is the kingdom way. So I hope I made the point the gospel must not just be believed. It's not just some hairy-fairy good feeling you have. It's a life of obedience. It's a life of worship. It's a life of fearing God. This gospel so transforms us that we live it and breathe it and talk it and walk it, exude it. It's our worship of God. It's our faith in God. The good news is also that God can now live in us to give us life and to walk a new way in obedience to Him by His power, by His Holy Spirit, by His mind, which we soak our minds in every day in the Word of God. If we're not, we're, we're, we're not living it, brethren. We've got to eat the manna. Hear my sermon on, 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 have you eaten your manna today? If you, have a trouble, if you have trouble with Bible study, go back and hear my sermon on have you collected your manna. Go back and hear that one. You know why Jesus resurrected Lazarus, though? Because Jesus is the way. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the life, the truth, and the way. We're all going to die sooner or later. It wasn't so much that Lazarus needed to live a few more years. It was to provide an object lesson that we who are dead in our sins, we're always thinking physically, Jesus resurrected a physical man to physical life. That wasn't the point. The point was what he was saying to Martha and Mary before that happened. Do you believe that Lazarus will rise again? I believe, Lord, in the last day. And then Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And we do have life in Jesus and access to the Father. Jesus used the resurrection of Lazarus to talk about himself and his purpose, that he is the resurrection and the life, that if we believe in him, we'll see life. That's what John 11 is all about, the resurrection. It's about the good news, the gospel of our salvation, the gospel of our eternal life, the gospel of a new life in Christ. And yes, that's part of the gospel too. Ephesians 1.13 says the gospel of salvation. It's not a different gospel. It's just part of the same one. Now let's look at the rest of the time we have. I may not have time to finish it all. You may have to just look at the transcript. It's so exciting to me how the gospel was preached from the very beginning. Hebrews 4 says it was preached to Israel, but they wouldn't listen to it. Romans 1, all this is in my transcript, says the prophets declared the gospel. Galatians 3.8 says Abraham had the gospel preached to him. So let's start in the very beginning when God created the garden and what is what Garden of Delights, what Eden means. I've already shown you that Paul himself says that he preached, the, the gospel he preached included the message of the cross and the resurrection of Christ. The Bible says Jesus was crucified from the very foundation of the world. God's plan of salvation was in play from the very beginning. God knew Adam and Eve on their own steam could not beat Satan. God knew it. So from the very beginning, Satan, uh, God already knew that, that his son, Jesus, would have to die. It was as good as done. 
If you go back to one of my favorite sermon series I gave in 2004 titled The Mystery of Christ and the Church, 2004, you'll see how various women were types of the church. Eve, before her sin. Rebecca, the wife of Isaac, was a type of the church. The Proverbs 31 woman, I believe, was a type of the church. The nation of Israel was supposed to be a type of the church. Ruth, the wife of Boaz, and so on. The Shulamite wife in the Song of Solomon. All of these were types of the bride of Christ. And if you haven't heard the series... Please go back and download it and listen to it. Now, why do I mention the bride? Because all of history is about preparing a bride for the Creator. Every event in history of the nations is only significant, as far as I'm concerned, in relation to what it did to position God's people to be prepared to be the the, the, the (laughs) the wife or the bride of Christ. God created Adam outside the Garden of Eden. It's what it says in Genesis 2, verses 6 and 7, and then put him into the Garden to show us that we have to be invited into God's presence. Later, God had Adam name the creatures. This was all on the sixth day, and there was not found a mate for Adam. So from Adam's side on the sixth day, from his bones and his flesh, God built a woman, and they were of one body, and they became as one. And Paul teaches us the point of all of this was not a cute story, but to picture again the spiritual, that the bride of Christ, since Adam was a type of Christ, he's called the Jesus, I mean Adam's called the first Adam, Jesus is called the second Adam, that the bride of Christ was part of his body, bone of his bones. We are part of the body of Christ. The bride of Christ was made possible when Christ, like Adam, gave up a part of his side on Calvary. Remember when the Roman soldier thrust the spear in his side in John, the book of John? And out came water and fluid and no doubt some flesh oozed out of there. It was through that hole in his side that God was able to make a bride. In creating Eve from the body of Adam, the gospel was being preached. God knew they would sin, and so Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. But the plan of eternal life was promised actually before time began, Titus 1, verse 2. Before time began, before there was a sun and a moon and an earth, There was a plan of eternal life. Then Jesus himself and his sacrifice was foreordained before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times. I'm quoting 1 Peter 1 and verse 20. No other religion on earth even has a God, first of all. Oh, they have gods, but they're not real. They don't live. They're not living gods. There's no Buddha. There's no Allah. And don't think that Allah is just another name for our God. It's not, brethren. Allah was a moon God. Why do you think they have the crescent moon as their symbol? Allah was a moon God. Allah's religion, Allah's teachings, very different from the teachings of the true God. And these false gods are myths. The moon god Allah doesn't even exist, nor does Buddha, nor does any of the other false gods. Never think that there's any god but God. But anyway, no other religion has their god coming to live as a mere mortal, dying for his creation, that they may be forgiven and saved, and then sharing everything with them, and giving, being the greatest servant of all, giving of his life, The gods you read of in Greek mythology and so forth, the gods you read of from the islands of the Pacific, these are weird gods, self-serving, vicious, mean, cruel. Gods of the Incas and gods of the Mayas and gods of the Aztecs demanded human blood. By the scores of thousands, they had human sacrifices. There was no glory in those empires. There was no glory in their God worship. Our God is different. 
Adam and Eve were both created on the sixth day. And at the end of the first six days of creation, at the end of each day, God looked at what he'd created and says, Behold, it was good. At the end of the seventh day, after creating man and woman, he says, Behold, it was very good. Now notice when God creates the Sabbath by putting his holy presence into it, into a day which he rested, way back at creation, there is no statement like, and it was the seventh day and God saw that it was good. There's no, sen no sentence like that. Read that in the first three verses of Genesis 2. Why doesn't it say, and the evening and the morning were the seventh day? It doesn't say that. Because though the other acts of creation were completed on each of those days, the Sabbath is to go on forever. There remains a rest, a keeping of the Sabbath. There remains a rest. And Jesus is our rest. And he lives forever. And our rest is in the kingdom of God that will be coming. And I don't mean the millennium. I mean the kingdom of God. The spirit family of God that begins ruling during the millennium but will rule forever and ever and ever and will not stop at the end of the millennium. It just, then everybody, everything is handed over to God the Father and sin and death have been vanquished. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 and 28, that then Jesus himself hands everything over to the Father. So anyway, my point is, even in the creation, even on the Sabbath day, God was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then when Adam and Eve sinned, God said to Adam and Eve, God said to the serpent in Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15, he curses the serpent in Genesis 3, 14, and then in 15 he says, and I will put enmity, this is the gospel message also, part of it, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Satan has his people. Jesus said to the people of his day, your father's the devil. He says that in the book of John. And so the seed of the woman, the seed of the, is the church versus the seed of Satan. And he, the seed of Eve, which is Jesus, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So that's part of the gospel also, that Jesus would have victory over the serpent. He became sin for us, it says in 2 Corinthians 5. And then just as Jesus is our covering for our sins, Romans 4, 7, says Jesus is our covering for our sins. What, is, what does God do to Adam and Eve? God, God brings them in and he draws blood in that garden. He sacrifices an innocent animal, probably a lamb or a ram. Look at it in Genesis 3, 21. This too was a picture of the gospel, part of the gospel message. I'm confident that God explained to Adam and Eve all about sacrifices and innocent blood having to be shed. For without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And so they can look forward to the one that that blood represented. I think God taught them about that at that point as he gave them a proper covering instead of fig leaves. Genesis 3:21. And then for Adam and Eve, the Lord God made tunics of skin. That means an animal had to die. That means blood had to be shed and clothed them. An innocent life died so Adam and Eve could be covered. And then God had to cut all mankind off from him because they had selected and, and, and chosen to go the wrong way. And so all the descendants, just like if I make certain decisions in my family, it affects my entire family. Except for a few selected few, the first fruits, whom God would individually call to a knowledge of him and a relationship with him, all descendants of Adam and Eve have been out of the garden ever since, except a few to whom God has offered the tree of life. And you are among those few, if you're hearing this message. Genesis 3:22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, <clears throat> to know good and evil. And now lest he put his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Oh, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden, to till the ground from which he was taken. You see, he was taken from the ground outside the garden and then put into the garden. It says in Genesis 2, verse 6 and 7, and now he's back out from where he came. <clears throat> so he drove out the man and the woman too, and he placed the cherubim, more than one cherub, 
at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And now the way to God was closed, unless God opens the way by special invitation. In understanding the plan of God's salvation, it's important to understand God is not trying to save everyone right now. God is not losing any battle for people's eternity. He just is not. But when Adam and Eve had two sons, and those two sons may have been twins, Scripture doesn't use the customary language that every time a woman uh, gave birth, it would start by saying she conceived and bore. It doesn't say that about Abel. She simply bore again. And so it implies that there was not another conception prior to Abel. It implies that she was carrying twins. And hence I believe, in fact, that would make sense if God wanted to populate the earth, that she probably had a series of twins, and who knows, maybe triplets even. Abel, under, apparently she had 60 kids, um, according to the Jewish teachings, 30 boys, 30 girls. Abel understood about sacrifices. For it says, in the process of time, and the Hebrew implies a specific time of worship that God had ordained for them to come before him. So usually referred to a particular time at the end of a time, Abel brought his bloody animal sacrifice. He was a shepherd, like Jesus was called a shepherd. And Abel brought a blood sacrifice, for he understood the plan of salvation required. Jesus to come and die, and without blood there is no forgiveness, it says in Hebrews 9. The whole chapter 9 is a lot about that of Hebrews, Hebrews 9.22. So Abel was living that part of the gospel. Next we read of Seth and Enoch and Noah. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the eternal. If he found grace, he must have been looking for it and needed it. For we all have sinned, including Noah. And the gospel is also the good news of grace. That is also the gospel. If you don't think it is, Pause the tape and turn to Acts 20, verse 24, and read it with your own eyes. The gospel of grace is part of the gospel. Has to be part of the gospel. For without grace, there would be no kingdom. Without grace, there would be no resurrection. Without grace, there would be no cross. Without grace, there would be no future for us. It is a must that it must include grace to be in the gospel. God saved mankind alive with eight lives because of God's grace, which Noah had found, and Noah's righteousness. Eight stands for new beginnings. God made a covenant with them with a rainbow in the sky, a new beginning. Next, God calls Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, and, and in faith Abram obeyed. And Genesis 12 is a prophecy that in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Genesis 12, verses 3 and 7. And in that seed, verse 7, Galatians 3 makes it real clear that that was a prophecy for Jesus Christ. And in this was the gospel preached also. And then in Genesis 15, verse 1, God says, Don't be afraid. I am your exceedingly great reward. And in verse 6, Genesis 15, 6, And he believed in the Lord in the eternal, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. I want you to read Romans 4 all by yourself sometime and see what all that means. It will blow your mind. He believed God, and that belief, in that belief, righteousness was imputed to him. In, Genesis, in Romans 4, you read it for your own self. And then in Genesis 22, Abraham acts out the role of God the Father. And 33-year-old Isaac acted out the role of our Savior, being willing to be sacrificed. In this case, though, once God could see Abraham's faith, God provided a substitute, the ram caught by his horns, the shofar that declares our liberty in Christ during God's holy days. He was caught by the part that they would use as the shofar. And the shofar was, was blown on the day of Jubilee. The shofar was blown on the holy days. Brethren, there is so much. There is so much about the gospel in the Old Testament. I'm just, I'm hope whetting your appetite to study it yourself. That's my real purpose. My real purpose is not to preach to everybody, but to get you studying God's word more yourself. It was after this that another gospel message was preached in Genesis 22:18. 18. 
in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So yes, Abraham obeyed God and Abraham believed God. They go hand in hand, like I said earlier. Paul uses that very passage to declare the proof that the good news of Jesus Christ was preached to the gospel, I mean, was preached to the prophets. In Galatians 3, verses 7 to 9, therefore know, Galatians 3, verses 7 to 9, therefore know that only those who are of the faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, justify them by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. The blessing of the nations through Abraham was through his seed, which Paul clearly identifies as Jesus Christ. That's a huge part of the gospel. Galatians 3.16, read that also. Then in Genesis 24, when Isaac needed a bride, Abraham sent his servant to his homeland, to his own household. Rebekah was found at the spring of living waters. It wasn't just a well. It was a bubbling spring. Just like God's people are going to be where the Holy Spirit is. She was there drawing water as we need to be using and living God's Holy Spirit. Her father's name was Bethuel, which means house of God. Of course, brethren, the bride of Isaac, who was a type of Christ, must be of the house of God. God's son must also marry a bride from the house of God. For we must be like of like mind, even of the same body and same flesh and blood, for that matter. The house of God is the church. And I've been speaking a lot about this house of God, how it has to be a house of prayer, a house of worship, consecrated, sanctified as a sanctuary for God's Spirit. I've spoken about it in the tabernacle of David, how David, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, had singing and praising, even dancing and worshiping going on in that tabernacle of David. You need to hear that message, the two-part message, if you haven't yet. Rebecca, who pictured the church, went to Isaac in Abraham's home for the wedding, she loved Isaac without seeing him, before seeing him, and we must love God though we haven't seen him. She had to leave her place and move to another and follow the servant to her new home. We too will be brought back by Jesus' servants, the angels, to Christ, the reality of Isaac, and go where Christ is. We rise with Christ to be married by our Father and taken by God's servants, there, taken there by God's servants, the angels. God the Father is the king who will put on a wedding for his son. And what happened next with Isaac? Genesis 24, verse 67. Genesis 24, 67. Then Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother Sarah's tent. And he took Rebekah and she became his wife and she loved him and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Sarah, the Bible says Sarah in Galatians 4, verses 25 and 26, pictures Jerusalem above in heaven. Jerusalem, the mother of us all. So Sarah represents heavenly Jerusalem. What did Isaac do? He took Rebekah, the daughter of the house of God, Bethuel, into Sarah's tent to consummate their marriage. Jesus is going to take his church, the daughter of the house of God also, into heavenly Jerusalem to consummate his wedding. The wedding of Christ and his bride is clearly set in heaven in Revelation 19. And then we come back down with him to start a new life together with our husband. We're born. We're registered in heavenly Mount Zion. Psalm 87 verses 4 and 5 says that. And of Zion it will be said, Psalm 87, 5 and 6, This is one that was born in her, and the Most High himself shall establish her. The Eternal will record, will record when he... Re registers his people. This one was born there in Mount Zion in heaven above. Psalm 87, verse 5 and 6. So Jesus meant it when he said he was going to go prepare a place for us. And it's not just a place to get married in. That's going to be our home. I really believe it. If we're going to work here on earth. I think it's very possible we'll reside in heaven. 
And then when the when the heaven comes down to earth in Revelation twenty one twenty two, it's adorned as a bride. We're the bride, but that's our home. Oh, brethren, there's so much in the Old Testament. There was a former preaching the gospel, the Passover, the manna, the fresh living water from the rock. Even Christ becoming sin for us, pictured by the bronze serpent in Numbers 24. Jesus himself says so in John 3, verses 14 and 15, that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Even the name of the leader who took them into the promised land, Joshua, is the exact Name of Jesus. Jesus is the Greek form. The Hebrew form is Joshua. Same name. It is Joshua. It is Jesus who will take us into God's kingdom. And there are people who wonder if God knows who we are before we're born and what we're going to do before we're born. Uh, do you think God just, oh yeah, Joshua, that's a good name. Let's pick that one. No, this was the guy who was groomed from the beginning to be a type of Jesus leading them into the promised land. There's so much more, but we're running out of time. The point I want you to remember, the good news, the gospel is so much bigger, so much broader. Hear my Holy Day, uh, my holy day uh, sermons, uh, because in them I'm going to reveal more of the gospel plan of salvation, the kingdom of God coming, the family of God, the way of God, the believing and obeying of God, the overcoming we must do. All of that's the gospel. All of that is. It is so much bigger, so much broader than saying it's just the kingdom, but not about Jesus. That is so lame. And it's equally lame to say it's just about the cross, but not about the kingdom, or it's not about obedience. That is so lame. That's simply not reading the Bible. Read the whole Bible, for in it is the gospel, in it is the good news. It is much bigger, much broader than many have thought. It is not just this or just that but much, much bigger. And I believe ultimately it's the whole Bible. It really is. Every word of God is ultimately the good news. It's the coming kingdom. It's the way into the kingdom. It's all about Jesus. It's also about the good news of peace. It's also about a world living in harmonious love. It's salvation. It's about the things we read about Israel and Boaz and Ruth. I'm going to give one next uh, spring about Ruth and Boaz. Make sure you hear that. It has a lot to do with the gospel. Make sure you hear the sermon about the Shulamite uh, woman uh, that I'm going to be talking about here, the Laodiceans, you know, uh, type the Shulamite wife there who was getting ready for bed and wanted, didn't want to answer the door. So we lock out our beloved outside his own home, outside his own door. He is the door. He's knocking on that door to come in. What's the matter with us? We've got to wake up, brethren. Our beloved Jesus is outside wanting in. Let's open the door that he may come and dine with us and, and have an exciting time with us. We should adore and worship our Father, praise our beloved Jesus, for the gospel is being preached and will be preached before the wonderful second coming of the Son of God and our King of Kings. God, hasten that day. Accept the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Help proclaim it, brethren. You are part of it. Live the gospel. Believe it and obey it. Until next time. This is Philip Shields, your brother. Pray for me, brethren. I know many people are listening to the website now. I have no idea who you all are. I'd love some encouragement and some prayers, more importantly, that God will continue to grant us the time to do it, the means to do it, the inspiration, the words, the thoughts, the energy to continue to do this labor of love. And God bless you all. I wouldn't mind hearing from some of you. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to help answer them. God bless you. I love you. And until next time. Enjoy, relish, live, trust the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.